After the 107 facts about Atlantis that we did, a movie that got requested more than a few times was Treasure Planet. So in a blazing fast three months, here it is. I'm Keegan, and these are 107 facts you should know about Disney's Treasure Planet. Number 1. Directors John Musker and Roger Clements had been trying to get this movie off the ground for years. They first pitched the idea to Disney back in 1985, but were continuously rejected and put onto other projects, including The Rescuers, Aladdin, and Hercules. Number 2. It was that last one that finally allowed them to realize their dream project. They agreed to direct Hercules, but only if Disney would let them do Treasure Planet immediately after. Number 3. And while you might interpret that as this movie having spent 17 years in production, which would frankly be absurd, the fact that production only began in earnest in 1997 means that it was only 5 years, about average for an animated Disney movie. Number 4. This movie still holds the record of being Disney's most expensive 2D animated movie ever, with a production budget coming in at $140 million, plus an additional $40 million for marketing. Number 5. Part of the reason for this inflated budget compared to other movies at the time was the radical animation. The humans are hand-drawn, Ben and John Silver's cyborg parts are flat-rendered CGI, and the ship was created using Disney's deep canvas technique. There are a few shots that required all three at the same time. Number 6. Not that the money did the movie much good. This was Disney's biggest financial loss for years, up until the release of The Lone Ranger in 2013. Number 7. Towards the end of the Disney renaissance, it became more common for their movies to be released twice a year, but 2002 with both Lilo and Stitch and Treasure Planet would be the last time this happened until 2016. Number 8. This was not Disney's first stab at adapting the novel of Treasure Island to the big screen. Their first attempt was made in 1950, and while the 1996 movie Muppet Treasure Island was not made by Disney, it was distributed by them. Number 9. Similarly, John Silver's appearance and vocal performance was roughly based on that of Wallace Beery's in the 1934 adaptation of the novel. Ah, the joys of works in the public domain. Number 10. The ship's full title is the RLS Legacy. While prefixes like that are fairly common for ships, particularly navy ships or ships under government contracts, here it's an homage to the writer of the novel, Robert Louis Stevenson. Number 11. In the novel, the name of the ship used to search for the treasure is the Hispaniola. Why it was changed, it could either be to make it easier to pronounce, or because it could be odd to have a ship named after a Caribbean island in the sci-fi future. Number 12. While the way the sails unfurl on the legacy isn't even close to how real tall ships had their sails drop, NASA probes Insight and Lucy would go on to use a suspiciously similar technique for unfolding their solar panels. Number 13. There's actually a little bit of confusion over who exactly owns the ship. Doppler says he will charter one, but it's flying the navy flag of the in-universe Terran Empire, for which Captain Amelia is an officer. Number 14. Yes, there are actually two known flags for the Terran Empire, the Civil Flag and the Royal Navy Jack. Number 15. Montresor was quite possibly named after the character from Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Cask of Amontillado. Number 16. In the DVD extras, it's revealed that Montresor is primarily a mining planet. While this does add up with the excavation we see Jim flying through in the opening, it doesn't get mentioned again afterwards. Number 17. The second theatrical trailer of the movie had the arch over the Disney logo morph into the spaceport. Number 18. According to art director Andy Gaskill, something called the 70-30 law was implemented for this movie. 70% traditional art, 30% sci-fi. Number 19. One of the main inspirations for the look of the traditional art was what the animation team called classic storybook illustration with its painterly feel and warm colors. Number 20. In one case, they took this quite literally, turning the painting The Hostage by N.C. Wyeth into a shot in the climax. Number 21. In order to see how well the integration of CGI with the traditional character animation would work for John Silver's cyborg parts, the team took footage of Captain Hook from the 1953 Peter Pan version and gave him the cyborg arm instead. Number 22. 
The score was originally supposed to be composed by Alan Silvestri, later of Avengers fame, but he left Treasure Planet to do the score for Lilo and Stitch. Number 23. In the end, the soundtrack was composed by James Newton Howard, later of Dark Knight fame, and he had only five months to compose and record the whole thing, which is not much. Number 24. While John Silver having a leitmotif as a main supporting character isn't too unusual, what's notable here is that it really only shows up when he's acting as the good guy rather than the villain. Number 25. The song Always Know Where You Are was written and recorded by John Rzeznik for the song that plays over the end credits. However, the version that appears on the album version of the OST was recorded by the British group BB Mac. Number 26. It's strangely notable how all four times perps either show up or are mentioned, the purple fruit that's a hybrid between a pear and a plum, it signifies tension. When Jim first gets arrested, when Jim probes Silver, when Silver threatens Mr. Scroop, and when Jim accidentally eavesdrops on the planned mutiny. Number 27. Treasure Planet was Tony Jay's third and final performance in a Disney movie, after Beauty and the Beast and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, albeit in a much smaller role this time. He does the narration. Number 28. It was also the final role for Patrick McGuhan, voice of Billy Bones, who died in 2009. Number 29. Strangely enough, the original version of the opening would have been narrated by an adult Jim Hawkins. It's a bit longer, a bit more graphic, and would have contained a few more hints as to how Flint operated. It's not too widely available, but if you go looking for the original intro, you can find it online. Number 30. This was the first movie by Musker and Clements not to feature Frank Welker in some capacity. It would remain the only one until Moana in 2016. Number 31. This movie marked the first time voice acting for two of its main characters, Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Jim Hawkins and Emma Thompson as Captain Amelia. Number 32. Both of them would go on to do more voice acting for Disney, though for Gordon-Levitt it wasn't until the 2022 remake of Pinocchio. Number 33. Open auditions were held in London, New York, and Los Angeles, but the deck was stacked against whoever came in to try for the two mains. Casting director Ruth Lambert already had the winners in mind. Number 34. But that didn't stop big names from trying. Christopher Plummer, Sean Connery, Jim Broadbent, and Miguel Ferrer all auditioned for the role of John Silver. Number 35. Captain Amelia's design was actually changed fairly late in the game. Originally, she was going to have black hair, but this was changed to the light red shade matching her voice actress. Number 36. There were also plans to give her tentacle hair, something she would use to grab and hold small objects. Again, this idea was scrapped, but this would be a feature given to Davy Jones in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, although whether there's a direct link is unclear. Number 37. Her full name, Amelia Smollett, is once again a reference to the novel, where the captain of the ship is Alexander Smollett. Number 38. In the theatrical cut of the movie, when she clutches her side and looks at her hand after getting injured, it's covered in blood. This was removed for the DVD and VHS release. Number 39. According to Disney, she's 35 years old, though this is never mentioned in the movie. Number 40. It's rather fitting that she ended with four children at the end of the movie, given that Emma Thompson was pregnant during some of her recording sessions. Number 41. After the events of the movie, she did quite well, finding herself promoted to Admiral in the game that takes place afterwards. Number 42. Delbert Doppler was named after the Austrian physicist Christian Doppler, best known for describing the Doppler effect waves compressing and stretching when the source is moving, like a race car sounding higher in pitch when it's moving towards you and lower when moving away. Number 43. Him mentioning Alponian chowder that Sarah Hawkins gives him is a little nod to the Alpo Pet Food Company. Number 44. Doppler identifies these space whales as Orcus galacticus. While Orcus is a real genus in biology, it's a species of beetles. If they wanted to reference orcas, the name should have been Orkinus. Number 45. According to the tie-in video game Battle at Procyon, Doppler and Amelia are part of the same species, felonids. Why the males look like dogs and females like cats, I have no idea. Number 46. 
It does explain how they managed to have four children at the end of the movie. In Disney's 365 bedtime stories, they actually get names. Mady, Jib, Tilly, and Sunny. Number 47. And just to make this whole thing more bizarre, Disney demanded that a line be cut explaining that it was Doppler who gave birth to the children. Number 48. Doppler saying, Dang it, Jim, I'm an astronomer, not a doctor, is a nod to Star Trek, where the reverse of that phrase is frequently said by Leonard McCoy. Number 49. Jim Hawkins' middle name, Pleiades, comes from a star cluster in the constellation Taurus. Number 50. To signify his character arc from troublemaker bad boy to hero, the color of Jim's clothing becomes lighter and lighter as the movie goes on first changing from a black shirt to a lighter one, later on getting rid of his dark jacket, and eventually dressed in white in the epilogue. Number 51. Though, an argument can also be made that the color of his clothes symbolized Jim's grief over his father. He finds new father figures in Doppler, kind of, so his shirt becomes lighter. And when he finds a true new father figure in silver, he also ditches the jacket. Number 52. This idea of the colors of his clothes symbolizing his grief is a point strengthened by the fact that while Jim doesn't wear his jacket in the bonding montage and the supernova scene, he does shortly afterwards when he believes himself to be responsible for Mr. Arrow's death. Number 53. While Jim's father suffering from a bad case of not there isn't exactly unique for the parents of Disney protagonists, one might say it's ubiquitous for them to be missing at least one parent, he does stand out for having just left, rather than dying some kind of tragic death. Number 54. In fact, Jim's father is mentioned to have died a tragic death of illness in the novel. Makes the movie seem more cruel, which is strange considering Disney's typical habit of making their movies more child-friendly than the source material. Number 55. His name is actually revealed in the art book, Leland Hawkins. Number 56. According to a deleted scene, Jim Hawkins is 15 years old. Number 57. Various actors were considered to voice Jim Hawkins, including Michael J. Fox, Jared Leto, Anthony Michael Hall, and perhaps most bizarrely of all, Tom Cruise. Perhaps for the best that they didn't get the then 40-year-old man to voice a teenager. Number 58. And for those wondering, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was 21 when the movie came out, so at least he was still a teenager when he recorded his voice lines. Number 59. If you're a surfer, you might have picked up on Jim's stance on his solar surfer, which is known as Goofy. Right foot at the front, left foot in the rear. Number 60. Speculation time. It could be done to reference the character, a nod for those who recognize it, or to showcase Jim as a rebel, not conforming to what is considered regular. Number 61. In spite of this, he is clearly a diligent worker, as even Silver seems impressed at how quickly he got through the gigantic mountain of dishes he had Jim clean. Number 62. According to supervising animator Glenn Keane, Jim Hawkins' personality was based on that of James Dean. Number 63. The scene where both Jim and Silver are trying to coax Morph into bringing them the map was improvised by the voice actors. Number 64. The animators went to a Benihana restaurant to observe how to animate the scene where John Silver chops the shrimp. Number 65. The circles in John Silver's cybernetic eye do occasionally form the shape of Mickey Mouse. Number 66. Even though he appears broadly human, Silver's race is said to be Ursid, a bear-human hybrid of alien species. Number 67. This is strangely fitting with both what we see and how he is described in the book, namely as extremely strong in spite of his missing leg. Number 68. Note from the writer. While I mentioned Mrs. Packard from Atlantis to be the last character in a Disney movie scene smoking on screen, John Silver does hold a pipe while comforting Jim. However, he does not take a puff of it, so I stand by that fact. Number 69. The way John Silver talked about Jim in front of the mutineers is actually pretty close to the way he genuinely feels in the book. Here, it's more of a facade though. Number 70. The flag the mutineers raise is the same flag seen flying on Flint's ship in the opening. While that isn't how Jolly Rogers were used in the golden age of piracy, it's a nice little nod given Silver's goal. Number 71. 
The job of popping the muscles and barnacles off the side of the ship Jim and Silver are seen doing is known as careening. Of course, it's made vastly easier by them being in space, as it would normally require hauling the ship ashore. Number 72. The name of Mr. Scroop is one of the few that did not come from the original novel, instead sharing his name with the characters from the Shakespeare play Henry V. His novel counterpart is Israel Hands. Number 73. Like in the novel, Jim ends up killing Mr. Scroop slash Hands, though not in quite as graphic a fashion, causing him to float off into space instead of shooting him in the head. Nice. Number 74. Although, interestingly enough, there is a character called Hands among Silver's pirates, but he doesn't serve the same role in the story as he does in the book. Number 75. While the role of Scroop would ultimately go to Michael Wincott, Goran Wiesnitsch did do an audition for it. He didn't get it, but he would go on to voice another character who tries to see the evil plan through even though the main villain had a change of heart in 2002. He voiced Soto in Ice Age. Number 76. While plenty of the mutineers do die on screen, there are a couple of conspicuously absent ones that are not shown among the survivors after returning to Montresor. Most notably, Mr. Snuff, the alien who converses with Doppler in Flatula. Number 77. According to the animators, he was very difficult to animate with so many individually moving parts, so that's probably the why on that one. Number 78. The aliens who stick together in the head and body arrangement are called Oxy and Moron, and they are in fact brothers. Number 79. This movie has a, let's say, loose relationship with science and physics. However, one thing that's surprisingly close to reality is the time frame of the star going supernova and collapsing into a black hole, which can happen in as little as a single second. Number 80. Mr. Arrow's death of falling into a black hole is surprisingly horrifying as the massive gravity of the black hole would pull him apart atom by atom in a process called spaghettification. Thanks for adding a little bit of levity, science. Number 81. Doppler saying that the next wave will come in 47.2 seconds is pretty much spot on, as that is the exact amount of time that passes on screen before the next wave erupts. Number 82. Sadly, the same can't be said for Ben's calculations at the end of the movie. Time definitely gets a bit stretched to the amount he mentions. Number 83. Amelia almost succeeds in making her entire sentence monosyllabic, as she put it, were it not for the fact that she ends it with saying hired. So close, yet so far. Number 84. Hidden details time. On Jim's shelf, you can see both a Stitch figurine as well as the traditional hidden Mickey. Number 85. With a little bit of imagination, you can see Mr. Scroop in the clouds during the opening of the movie. Number 86. Also in the opening, the rug from Aladdin can be seen on the floor of Jim's room. Number 87. Ben is singing the song from Pirates of the Caribbean when Jim sneaks him aboard the Legacy. However, not in reference to the movie, that wouldn't come up for another year, instead referring to the ride at Disneyland. Number 88. The directors have a habit of animating themselves into the movie. In this case, the two are working with the latter, whom Jim asks for directions. Number 89. Right, let's talk about the movie's failure at the box office some more. A direct consequence was the cancellation of its planned sequel, where Jim would have to track down Silver and fight the villain Ironbeard. Number 90. Ironbeard was already cast. He would have been voiced by Willem Dafoe, indicating that the sequel was already quite far along in development when it was cancelled. Number 91. Of course, this doesn't answer the question of why the movie performed so badly at the box office, given that critics and audiences at the time liked it just fine. Some blame it on being released on the same day as the Adam Sandler comedy Eight Crazy Nights, but that seems unlikely given that movie also bombed. Number 92. Why people choose to blame that movie when Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and Die Another Day were also in theaters around the same time, I have no idea. Those seem to be the more likely culprits. Number 93. There are some who claim that this failure was engineered by Disney, 
that they deliberately let the budget spiral out of control, making it harder for the movie to recoup its investment. They did this ostensibly to justify shutting down the 2D animation department in favor of shifting over to 3D animation, which would happen two years later. Number 94. Evidence for this can also be found in the marketing campaign, which openly spoils John Silver's true nature, Morph's change of heart, and the mutiny that takes place. Number 95. Of course, one could also argue that Treasure Planet being based on a 100 plus year old book goes against the whole idea of spoilers, but most of the target audience wouldn't have read the book. You could go both ways there. Number 96. A more compelling argument lies in the fact that it was pulled from nearly half the theaters that were showing it after only three weeks. For comparison, Lilo and Stitch was running for almost two months before getting to that point. Number 97. But to argue in Disney's favor again, they held test screenings that had disappointing results. In an attempt to counter this, Disney actually increased the marketing budget, so exactly how much this conspiracy is worth depends on your own bias. Number 98. November was not a common month for Disney movies to be released in. Outside of Aladdin 10 years earlier, it was rare, until Treasure Planet. Virtually every other year has seen a Disney animated movie come out in November since then. Number 99. This underperformance made it the second nautical-themed Disney movie that was going to have a Disneyland ride, but had its ride cancelled for that reason, after Atlantis. As mentioned in the 107 Facts video, the theme would ultimately go to Finding Nemo. Number 100. And in a similar vein to Atlantis, Treasure Planet garnered quite a cult following over the years, which is probably the reason you're watching this video. Number 101. But not even poor box office could stop the video games from coming out in droves. First, the Battle of Procyon, which is still available on Steam, and separately developed games on the PS1, PS2, and Game Boy Advance. Number 102. Although one game series that Treasure Planet has been notably absent from is Kingdom Hearts. If there was ever a movie that could lend itself well to traveling to different worlds, it would be this one. Number 103. Then again, this wouldn't be the only Musker and Clements film to be snubbed from this dubious honor. The Great Mouse Detective never made it to that series either. Number 104. John Silver is the only character in that game to still be voiced by the same actor as they were in the movie. Brian Murray reprised his role while Jim Hawkins and Captain Amelia had to be recast. Number 105. This was the first movie made by a major studio to be simultaneously released in both regular and IMAX theaters. Number 106. It was also the last movie of Musker and Clements that would see a VHS release. Number 107. And finally, if you're watching when the video is still relatively new, then you'll be just in time for the 20th anniversary of the wide release on the 27th. Good an excuse as any for a rewatch, if you ask me. And that's it. 107 facts about Treasure Planet. Were there any facts we missed? And what's your favorite fact about this movie? Be sure to let us know in the comments below, and remember, Frederator loves you.